The sun is setting on the land of enchantment, and in stark contrast to the quiet of the New Mexico evening, awaits an arena bursting with energy. said I believe in dreams he feels they're a team of destiny they've won nine in a row Harry Quittenberg had a brilliant game the first time out 20 points now Derek on the offensive end of the court Gary probably has a bigger arsenal that he can beat you with than anybody in college ball he's got the 30-foot jumper as well as the power game inside and for a man have Quittenberg wide open in the corner oh and it's a two-point game that's where that oh Wittenberg, right. Wittenberg, he can tie it up. <laughs> Wittenberg, oh, it's a long way. Oh, it's it. They won it. On the dunk. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to this 12th edition of Somehow We Manage. I'm Kagan Jackson, and I'm joined, as always, by Mr. Spencer Hargrove. Spence, have you recovered? That's the question. Have you recovered from the, the, from the Rona? Uh, I have. I have. I'm feeling a lot better. Um, still, got, still having a little bit of uh, effects from COVID, but for the most part, I'm uh, alive and well. That's alive good. and well. Good. Glad to hear. Well, Spence, we're, you're going to need your energy today. Because our guest, we, we got a we got a pretty special guest today, and we're we're gonna we're gonna need to bring it today. So let's go ahead and introduce him, Mr. Derek Wittenberg. Witt, how you doing? I'm doing tremendous, man. And uh, you know, if he had the corona, you know, should we be wearing masks on this uh, interview? <laughs> I don't think Just I don't think case. quite at that risk there, but but maybe. Okay, Just, all right. You all know, right. maybe to okay. be safe. All right, we'll, we'll be okay. We'll be safe then. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I want to start by, by saying this. So uh, when I was 14 years old, I went to NC State basketball camp. And, you know, the first day of camp, you do your uh, orientation, all that stuff. You meet the players. Well, I know you don't remember this, but you were there and we met. You know, I shook your hand, all that stuff. Um, and I asked you a question that I'd always wanted to ask. And I said, uh, I said, hey, Coach Witt, what, was it a shot or a pass? And I, wa I didn't know it at the time, but looking back, you'd probably been asked that about 100 times that day already and probably, you know, a million <laughs> times over the course of your life. So I I'm going to ask you, like I asked your, uh, your teammate, Thurl Bailey, um, do, do you get tired or, you know, does it ever get annoying? You know, just people always coming up and asking, you know, what, was it a shot or a pass? What about this? What about that? Does it ever – do you ever get tired of it? Well, how can you get tired of it when people come to you with so much enthusiasm right. and excitement about asking that question? And uh, we're going on 30 years, getting ready to celebrate 40 years of a great run, which is incredible that people are still talking about remembering where they were and, and who they were with and, and when they were watching the game. So, uh, no, you can never get tired of something like that. That's that's all positive stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, and I, I also asked Thurl this, and I'll ask you, um, does it bother you 
that, you know, the 83 run is now it's remembered as it was a miracle. You know, it, it shouldn't have been, you know, you guys weren't really that good. Does, does it bother you a little bit that you, they kind of uh, say that you guys weren't that great of a team. Does, does that ever bother you? Uh, no, it doesn't bother me at all because, you know, we played in the best conference in the country, the ACC. And uh, in that, in the beginning of the year, we were ranked in the top 25. And we played the number one team in the country seven times. So people just don't know the facts. We were a very good team, a senior laden team uh, that was had all the potential in the world uh, to beat anybody. And so if they look at the facts about how good we are, you know, they would never say it was a it was a miracle run, but it wasn't a team that was uh, in theory. We, we had a good basketball team. Right. So so you're standing in the pit in Albuquerque, New Mexico. You know, your dreams have come true. You've won the national championship. You're, you're young, 19, 20 years old, whatever. Would you have thought in that moment that you'd be here now almost 40 years later and that it's been talked about so much and, you know, you've been a part of all the things you have and your teammates have been a part of all these special things? Would you have ever thought in that moment that it would have touched as many people as it did? Well, my journey and my dream is somewhat remarkable, starting with, you know, my family migrating from the south to the north and and uh, for, for better opportunities. And then me growing up in the Washington, D.C. area, getting the chance to play organized sports and then having the opportunity to go to a school like DeMatha High School was one of the best uh, high schools in the country and then winning a the national championship there in, in 78 with Sidney Lowe going undefeated 28-0. And then four years later, winning the national championship, a kid from growing up in Washington, D.C., that got a chance to visit the White House twice with Ronald Reagan in 83, and then 30 years later with uh, President Obama in 2016, is an incredible journey. And had no idea that this was ever going to happen. But I also understood that everything is possible. And so we, we, I dreamed it. Uh, we, we believed it. And uh, you know, the rest is, is some of it's, uh, it's a little bit of luck. Some of it's hard work. Some of it's destiny. But uh, I am uh, enjoying this journey because the journey is not over. The journey is just beginning. And uh, we can use this great run to really – inspire and empower people that they can achieve whatever they want to as well. If they look at what we achieved in 1983, 39 years ago. It's not over yet. I love that. It's a great attitude. Um, I'll, I'll share another quick story uh, for you. Um, and this isn't from me. I'm doing this for my dad. So he, uh, he was 12 years old when you guys, when you guys won it all. Um, and he told me I had to, I told him I was, was meeting with you. He said, you gotta, you gotta tell Derek this. So uh, when you went down against Virginia, uh, you know, on Othell Wilson's foot, all that stuff, when you got injured um, and you guys went on to lose, you know, he was, you know, I said he's 12 years old and he was crying on the couch. He was at his granddad's house and he, he was sobbing. He was like, you know, Wittenberg's done. We won't win another game, all this stuff, you know. And uh, his granddad actually told him he, he was a Carolina fan. And he told him, he said, son, he said, don't worry about it. He said, he'll come back and they'll win the national championship. And he wanted me to tell you that. And it's uh, the rest <laughs> is history. <laughs> Yeah, I just hope we can get converted granddad, you know, because I know he's a Carolina fan. But, yeah. But, uh, but he saw that amazing run. And, and uh, you know, when I hurt my foot, I had really hurt my foot in high school uh, the same way, just opposite foots. And so I, I thought that uh, it was there was opportunity for me to come back. Didn't know when, but I, I, I knew it was possible. And uh, – but the team recovered uh, – uh, very nicely. I mean, Ernie Myers came in and took it, did a nice job taking my place and George McClain and Terry Gannon and, you know, a lot of those guys stepped up and, uh, and then when I came back, uh, we, we were a better team. So, uh, my, my absence during that time really, uh, helped our team persevere and, uh, really handle some adversity. And, and coach V was the leader. He was the guy that, kept everybody up and positive about 
you know, all the wits out that we still can do this thing. Yeah, so, so talking about, you know, Coach V, um, you know, your team's legacy obviously still lives on, but, but Coach V's legacy, you know, his, his lives on through, too, through the V Foundation, all, all this great stuff. So could you describe for us, you know, who he was um, as a man and as a coach? Well, it, it, uh, Coach Valvano loved life. He's enthusiastic about people. Uh, I never saw the man down one day of, of his life, even when he's fighting cancer. And uh, he, 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 he taught us about passion. He taught us about enthusiasm, about being positive and about dreaming and having a vision. And, and um, you know, his legacy lives on through the V Foundation, the great work we've done in the last 29 years. We're getting ready to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the V Foundation next year and the 40th of the 83 team uh, what, what remarkable things we've achieved in the v foundation but a hundred percent every dollar going to cancer research and and a lot of people wouldn't think about cancer 29 years ago and uh the v foundation and jimmy v brought that awareness out so um his legacy is incredible and it lives through the v foundation but the v foundation wouldn't be possible without that great run by the a group of ordinary guys from all over the place that achieved that something that was extraordinary. And uh, that's what life's about. Um, you, know, you know, doing it together uh, with a great a bunch of guys and really helping others, I think, is is what our, our, our whole legacy is all about. So we're, we're coming up on, on 40 years, um, you know, like you said, when, when you look back on all of it and you think about Coach V, is there a particular, you know, quote or, or story that really sticks out in your mind? Don't give up. Don't ever give up. That's the one, right? That, that's his slogan. And the other one is, uh, although Billy Packer owns the slogan, you know, survive in advance. That's, that's what we do every day. It's, we all know survive in advance. We survive in through COVID. Uh, through economic struggles, through normal life struggles. We all have to survive in advance. And uh, both of them, Jim, and kind of coined those phrases. And I live by those. And, and uh, there's not a day that I get a chance to wake up and I'm, I'm not enthusiastic about life and about the next journey and the next step. And, and it's exciting to uh, continue this journey. Because this now continue this journey is helping people like yourself, you two guys, in your you, you starting your journey, and 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 looking down the road at what your success may look like going down the road. That's what it's about. It's about service. It's about empowerment. It's about uh, it's about team. It's about leadership. All the tangibles and intangible things that we all need to be successful. So, um, you know, college basketball is, is so much different today than it was, you know, when you were playing, you know, NIL, AAU, um, shoe deals, all this stuff. Do you think that Coach V could, would have thrived if he was able to, to coach uh, in today's college basketball? Oh, absolutely. It's just – you know, it's just an adjustment um, with the transfer portal and the NIL. It's, it's just it's, everybody has to make an adjustment. And um, this is America. This is free enterprise. So we all own our own name, image, and likeness. And nobody can take, nobody can take advantage of that. Nobody can sell it but yourself. And so um, I understand that. The transfer portal, to be honest, we bothers me because it allows people to, although there's times when things don't work out, you can transfer, but also it gives people an opportunity for an out. If it doesn't work out, I can always go somewhere else. So it's positive in one sense. In another sense, it could be very dangerous. But nevertheless, I think everybody has to make an adjustment. And you still can, uh, this college game still could be great. Uh, we just got to manage all the new um, uh, requirements and things that we have to deal with and uh, make it work. Yeah. Um, you know, talking about Coach V, that 
what he's remembered for now, at least in my mind, um, you know, is the the speech at the ESPYs, right? You know, they play it every year on ESPN. Um, for you, I'm not sure where you were at the time, um, but you know, I think well, I think that the the speech he gave at Reynolds, I don't know, I think it was a little bit later. I know it was right there before he died. To me, as a state fan, that was uh, that was that was the one that sticks out. It just I don't know what it was. So for those two speeches, you know, I know you were there for the one in Reynolds. Um, when you see that, what what emotions does that conjure up, you know, and even then when it happened, you know, what were what you thinking in, in those moments? Uh, it's just typical Jimmy V, always alive, always positive. Uh, during his last days on this earth, the man was still trying to help people. And uh, although he said it may not save my life, but it may save someone you love, which is so just real today. We all deal with cancer. We had a friend, we had a family member, somebody to deal with cancer. So uh, he was a man ahead of his time. And it just makes me smile to think that uh, I was part of his journey and part of his legacy. You know, I'm the only player that was a Paul Byrne his funeral. I'm the only player that was appointed uh, to be on the V Foundation, v Foundation board as a founding member. I didn't ask for that. That was a calling. That was something that he felt with, through our relationship that he wanted me to be a part of. And I accepted it. You know, it's a lot of people that you work every day, but it's something special about a calling. When I wake up in the morning, I go to that office in NC State, it's, it's my school. It's a calling to help the current student athletes, to help people in cancer. It, you know, it's a calling. And, and um, it, it energizes me every day. So that's what Jim did for us. That's part of his legacy. I'm just happy to be a part of his legacy. So, yeah, talking about this, you know, your job at NC State now, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your role and, you know, what you're doing um, day to day? Day to day, I'm, I'm uh, obviously my role has changed because uh, uh, a lot of uh, changes in our athletic department university with uh, Bobby Purcell, who's a longtime Wolfpack um, leader, uh, is, is is stepped aside, and then uh, a new athletic director, Bill Corrigan, which I knew his dad, Gene Corrigan, who's a longtime commissioner for the ACC, very successful commissioner. So it's changed the fundraiser, but who I am and what I do every day is I would do it if I wasn't working there at all. Uh, mentoring student athletes, helping coaches, fundraising, working in the community, um, interacting with our donors. And that all becomes natural to me. And although I crafted up uh, a job description, all of that's a part of who I am and what I do every day. And um, it's, 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 it feels good. It's natural. And, uh, you know, to be passionate and come back to have an opportunity to work at your alma mater in this, in this fashion for me is a dream come true. So I'm enjoying it. Is that I don't have a down day every day. You know, like I told you guys, I had an accident and everybody thought, you know, accident that's a car right you know okay we move on from that but you know i still went to the red white store today talked to some uh some 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 donors and some fans took a picture with a young kid there and talked to a bunch of donors and alums today but and i I mean that this is fun man this is fun this one this this is not work this is like this is fun you know what i do every day so I'm enjoying my role as ambassador and associate AD, and uh, and uh, it's I, I look forward to doing it every day. Awesome, awesome. That's that's great. So I, I think a, a lesser part, or a, I should say, a lesser known um, part of your journey is that you actually, you know, have have done a lot of coaching. You know, since you uh, you play basketball at NC State, could you walk us through your your journey um, as a coach? Yeah, I mean, I was an assistant coach at probably 10 to 11 different schools. So Bobby Crimmins at Georgia Tech, uh, Gail Catlett, the Hall of Fame coach at West Virginia. 
I was with Valvano on two different uh, occasions, uh, Joe Harrington at University of Colorado and Long Beach State, uh, who was who worked for Lefty Giselle. So uh, my tree in terms of, of coaching is pretty strong. And of course, working and playing for the late uh, Morgan Wooten, the first high school coach in the Hall of Fame. Um, I've had some nice experiences, some great mentors in coaching. I've learned a lot in coaching. You know, I still got uh, the only uh, NCAA tournament at Wagner College and graduated every player and uh, had six guys on the dean's list. And at Fordham University, I still got the best record they had in the last 25 years and, and graduated all my players now. You know, coaching is not just about winning. Coaching is about leadership. And I think that I have every program that I coached as a head coach, I showed leadership by one, graduating my kids. Number two, my kids never got in trouble. They competed. They did everything with class. And we had success on the court. That's what the ultimate goal for college is. If you're just coming to college to make money, well, you should go right into the pros, in my opinion. If you can't enjoy the experience of college, then college is not for you. And that's okay. This is America. But I hope that the kids today don't lose the fact and the experience and the journey of that college experience. Because there's nothing like it. I can remember when I was recruiting uh, a mob, Stephon Marbury, number one player in the country. He graduated, had a great career at State, he only, uh, at Georgia Tech. He only had about nine months at Georgia Tech. And I went to see him. He was drafted by the Minnesota Timberwolves, and I went up to hang out with him. Here he is, a young kid, 20 years old, got all this money. He practiced for two hours. He didn't, have, he didn't know what to do. And he said to me, he says, you know what? Man, I missed the experience of college. He said, maybe I should have stayed one more year. I said, maybe you should, but you know, you know, make the best out of this, but he, that's the, the college experience and growing up and really being a better person and a better student, all that's great stuff that, that, and it's a great experience and uh, you shouldn't take it for granted. So aside from basketball, what would you say was, was the best part of your college experience? My relationships with my professors and donors and teammates and fans you know, the world's become so transactional now. We can touch on the phone. We can te we text before we call. We Zoom before we meet. But it's nothing like real relationships. Spending time with folks, hanging out with folks, uh, you know, having, having a beer, having a cup of coffee. It's nothing like the personal touch. It will never go away. And I cherish the most is the relationships that I've, built over the years that's that's what made life special what do you uh, what do you remember most about the your relationship and the team's relationship between uh the students at nc state because you know you hear all the the awesome stories about you know the um the when they put a car on fire in the brickyard on hillsborough street all that good stuff what, what do you remember most about you know that relationship uh great 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 fans, great students, NC State. I'm sure there's a lot of great fans and students everywhere, but I certainly love our fans and I love our students. They supported us tremendously. And uh, you know, the, the, the beauty about once you go on campus, you are a student. You know, you're a student first. Actually, you're a person first, then a student, and then you're an athlete. And I think we forget that sometimes. I think most people try to put us as athletes first and a person next and then a student last. And that's what disappoints me now is that nobody today in this current college talks about academics, talks about graduation. Everything is they talk about is NIL and transfer portal. We don't talk about the kids in the springtime that graduate. We don't talk about other kids that's doing something other than being successful in sports or entertainment. There's so many different success stories out there, but we don't talk about those. We only talk about the hot subjects. 
NIL. Trans- we have been, I've been on more podcasts than anybody you can imagine. And we never have the conversation about graduation and about academics and about education. That's why I wear this DW, because the Derry Gwynberg Foundation, my wife and I and our staff, we raise money to help juniors and seniors finish college. Because there's not, I talked to the 99%, 99% of the people that not only not going to play professionally, but also going to be successful doing something else in life. So I don't want people to lose the whole perspective and the bigger picture of how, what success really looks like. And it starts with you as a person and it starts with your education. And if you don't have that with your character, nobody's going to be successful in any endeavor. All right, Derek. So tell us more about the Derek Wittenberg Foundation. You know, you talked about how it's helping uh, junior and seniors finish college, but what made you want to start the foundation? What was your motivation behind starting the foundation? Well, my motivation was, was simple. I'm a first generation graduate, the first in my family to graduate from college and earn a four-year scholarship. And um, unlike most uh, athletes today, they think about being a pro first. But back then in the mid-70s, man, it was a it was an honor and privilege to, to get a college scholarship and a degree. I mean, that was huge. And so I've always been passionate about education. And uh, so... 2015, I was part of the Jimmy V restaurant and the ownership came to me and said, we want to do something in the community. And I said, well, would you guys help me start the Derek Wittenberg Foundation? And we have and uh, given out over 200 scholarships. We give out 5,000 and $2,500 scholarships and we try to support as many colleges as we can. We gave some scholarships to Wilmington, I want to add, and uh, hopefully we can do more, but uh, uh, it's it's fun. We don't give scholarships to athletes. It's, it's all uh, students uh, with some particular hardship. And we enjoyed it. We just had a great golf t- tournament at Northridge Country Club, a nice uh, reception. Uh, I, I got Kia down in Wilmington. Pat Kabbalah donated a nice golf cart. And we auctioned off. And we're going to give away some scholarships uh, with that donation. So we are excited. And, and happy about what we're doing, uh, you know, for the community, uh, because everybody is passionate about education. So my wife and I's uh, co-founders, Jacqueline Wittenberg, co-founder, does a lot. We've got a great board. Uh, our community, uh, we, we got great support and uh, we go and continue to help students. Well, you know, Spence is, is a huge golf guy. I mean, you guys have got to – I mean, you're having these golf tournaments and stuff. you got to get him on, on the on the course there. I mean, he might help you raise some money. I mean, this guy's the real deal. Well, I mean, not only he has to be good at golf, but he has to be good at fundraising. Right. Okay? Oh. we got to raise some money. I mean, he can hit a good ball, but he got to help us raise some money for the kids at Wilmington. I you actually – so, so we, we need to raise some money for those kids down there to help them out. I actually, my senior year of high school, uh, Kagan might know this. I actually, I uh, unfortunately lost my dad to suicide when I was 16. Uh, so my senior year, I actually put on a suicide awareness golf tournament. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm all in. I can help you out whenever. Well, if you come help me, I come help you. How about right. that? That sounds I'll, great. I'll help you, baby. I'll, I'll help you fundraise. Okay? That sounds great. Sounds yeah, great. In, in honor of your dad and, 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 the, and awareness, and, and if we can help some folks, I'd be happy to do that. Yes, sir. All right, I'll keep. I will definitely put you down on my list. Just remember, community is being involved and being present. Right. Right. And so, in order to grow together, everybody got to help each other a little bit. That's right. If everybody else helped, no, no, not just help me, but we help each other. Absolutely. If we do that, if we follow that philosophy, everybody would be helping everybody in, their, in, in all walks of life. So I'll be happy uh, to help you and, uh, and, and your calls, and you can come down. Now, if you don't bring your game, golf game in my tournament, you're going to get whooped, okay? <laughs> we got a lot of good golfers down here. 
So you better you better put your golf game on now. So I'll practice up the weeds we before. Yeah, we, maybe we play down in Cakefield Country Club or, there you or go. Landfall. Yeah, there we know, go. Or, or now Eagle you Point. Now or you Eagle talk. Point. Yeah, there we go. We got a golf tournament at Eagle Point. Let's do hey, it. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do you ever get a chance to golf? Do you play? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm America's I'm America's guest. If you invite me anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, and it's for free, I'm going. <laughs> Called America's Guest. <laughs> if you, everybody asks me, are you a member in the club? I'm a member of any club you want me to be a member of. Just invite me and I'll come. <laughs> Who are some of the best guys, uh, like, you know, former players, you know, people you get to come out to these events? Who are some of the best uh, golf golfers that you've got, uh, played with? Golfers? Golfers. Oh, oh man, there's so many good personalities out there. And, um, God, Leah, I have to sing an interview. We had, obviously, at State, we had David Thompson came out and hang out. Corn Robson, Dwayne Washington, who donated a million dollars to mm -hmm. the athletic department last year. Played for the Steelers. I'm a Steeler fan. He was great. He came out. Monty Tao and uh, Elliot. We, we've had some great state guys. But at my tournament, I had uh, two Carolina guys that snuck in there. Phil Ford, Al Wood came. Uh, we've had Bradford Marcellus come, who was uh, the, the great saxophonist. He, he was there. Scotty McQuarrie's been in my tournament. So we just look for, you know, even Randolph Childers was there. Uh, Keith Gatlin that played at Maryland. We've, we've had some some great guys at our tournaments. and But I, I go to a lot of different tournaments. So I'll see guys all over the place. And uh, it's nice to see celebrities out there helping folks fundraise. Well, you're going to have one Carolina fan sneak into your tournament. Kagan probably ain't told you that. Oh, yeah. We only have two. It's a limit. It's only two now, unless you bring some money. Now, if you bring money, listen, I used to tell Phil Ford this all the time. What's Carolina brew and red mixed together? Green. Green. <laughs> That's good. That's pretty good. Green. That's pretty good. <laughs> I'm going to use that for sure. <laughs> so, so sometimes, and, and we can use the Carolina and NC State rivalry to help people raise funds. That's what we'll do. That's right. Um, so when, when you put on, you know, events like that, uh, what, what does the process look like? You know, for how, I mean, how do you get all these people involved? How do you get, you know, I'm sure you got to make lots of phone calls to businesses. Like you said, you know, so-and-so donated a golf cart. I mean, how, how long does that take in advance? You know, what does that process look like when you put one of these big, you know, fundraising events together? It's, it's just connected with people. You know, I, I, I was a part of the 10 part series of the history of the ACC tournament that launched last February. Mm -hmm. And we had 175 interviews and I, uh, I've spent time with most of the players at most of the schools in the ACC. So I have some relationships. And so uh, it's a matter of, uh, can I help them? And will they help me? And will we help each other? And that's what it's basically about. It's every time in your space, I'm a brand for NC State, the V Foundation, the Derek Gwynberg Foundation, and anything else. It depends on what people's passions are, right? And some people can donate to all three or they can donate it to all different. You'd be surprised. People can spend a little bit of time, donate a little bit of time to everybody. You know, I give a speech. I speak across the country in these different uh, corporations. And I have a secret. It's called eight to five, five to 12. Most people only work from eight to five. That's their day job is what I outwork everybody in the country is from 5 p.m. to 12 p.m. Because I can take three, four days out of that time and meet some folks, connect with some folks during the week from 5 p.m. to 12 p.m. That's where I catch up. I'm intentional about any area that I go to, who I can connect to NC State, who I can connect to the foundation, who I can connect to people, in everything that I touch, I'm always looking to connect people. 
and that you learned that trait through recruiting and, and through college athletics in building relationship. They used to call it networking, but being intentional about building relationships and contacting people. I, I believe that I'm good at it, but I'm trying to get better at it every day. So, yeah, you, you mentioned, um, you know, your work on this, this new uh, documentary series uh, with the ACC, you know, You've worked on several projects. I think you've you know you've gotten some producer nods. So how does how does a guy like yourself, you know, a former athlete, you know, get involved with filmmaking? You know, what 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 made you want to uh, want to work on those projects? The best thing that ever happened to me is I got an opportunity to coach at Fordham University, and then they fired me in 2010. It seems like the worst thing in the world. Well, if they wouldn't have fired me, I would have never been a part of the number one sports documentary in the world, Survive in Advance 30 for 30 for ESPN. So I took something that appears to be a bad fortune and turned it into a good fortune. And you can't do that without people like Jonathan Hawk and his team and NC State and all the guys who participate, my teammates who participate in that film. I, I, because I took on something that was appeared to be a bad situation and turned it into a positive. So I'm a business major but you have to be, have a creative mind. So I said that this is a story we had to tell. How do we do it? Connect with some folks, executive producer. Then I, I helped produce the first two hour documentaries of the 30 for 30 series, the survive in advance and the gospel according to Mac. And that is not possible without connecting with people and having a creative mind and being able to do what? Finish. Just like my mantra says with Derek Winberg first, Derek Winberg Foundation, dream, believe, work, now finished. Everybody, 84% 84 of all the ideas that people come up with, they never finish them. So I just took some ideas, something creative, and I found the right connections, and I ended up finishing. And that's how you came up with those two films. Yeah. So, you know, what I'm hearing from you is, you know, you talk about, um, you know, being creative, being able to connect with people. Um, those are some God given skills that you have and you've, you know, you've used them to you know, be successful in your life. What do you have to say for young people now? Because, you know, with the Internet and everything, you know, it's now a greater time than ever to turn a skill that you have into, you know, a business or whatever. What do you have to say for young people today who, you know, for them to turn their skills into a career or whatever, you know, it may be? God given us uh, uh, the ability to wake up every day and, 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 and have opportunity. It is what you do with that opportunity. And it's nothing that I have done or a lot of us done that you can't do. And so if you want to learn and get better at something, connecting with people, talk to people who are good at it, right? You have more of an access to people than when I was growing up than I had. You can email CEOs. You can talk to folks. Uh, a lot of people like to mentor young folks. So reach out and connect with people. You'd be surprised. And I wanted to surround myself around with successful people. So the most successful people you could be around, the better you become. Awesome. Spence, what do you have to add to that? Um, I can just say, just hearing you, you have so much passion, like you talked about, in everything you do. Uh, it, it motivates me. I mean, I'm just graduating college, uh, starting my first job, um, and just talk about waking up every day and just trying to get better in everything you do. Like, that motivates me, absolutely. So I just, uh, as we close up here, thank you. That, uh, just everything you've done with your foundation, uh, I mean, it, it, it helps out and motivates more ways than you think. Absolutely. And, and it's here's the difference between motivation and empowerment. There's a lot of people to give these little quirky speeches. And they leave you with some good words. But it doesn't move you to change. Right. When you leave a speech for me, 
I empower you to change. I empower you to do something different that you, when you came there that you didn't do before. And that's the difference in great motivational speakers. The ability to empower over the difference to disinspire. I can inspire you for one day. You get all excited, but you don't, you don't change nothing. What, what you going to change? Are you going to change your work ethics? Are you going to read more? Are you going to connect with four, five more people in your business? You, you, you got to start, get a plan. A plan to change something for the betterment of your journey, for you to be better as a person, as a leader. You got to, you got to get a plan to get better every day and then connect yourself with more people and more positive, positive people. Now, guys, I'm giving y'all a lot. Y'all getting this for free, okay? Now, a lot of people pay a lot of money to get this, <laughs> all right? And you guys are getting this for free. But stay tuned, buddy. When my book comes out in 23, it's going to be a bestseller. It's going to be about connecting people. It's going to be about your journey. It's going to be about leadership. And there's a message. I don't want to write a book because to write a book, I want to promote a message of empowerment that people can read this and say, you know, I'm excited. I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to make something. I'm going to change something. I'm going to do better in that area. Cause we all look at our strengths, but we don't look at our weaknesses. We all have weaknesses. So how can we get better on our strengths, but also get better on our weaknesses? And most of us are weak, weaker in communicating with people knowing how to do that. How do you do that? I gave you the blueprint. Five, eight to five, five to 12. Figure it out. All right. Great stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Hey, I did, I, so you, are, you, are you actually in the process of writing a book or is this something off in, in the future? Oh, I'm in the process. Yes. I, I, I got, uh, I'm going to be starting here at the end of um, August and we're going to go through it. And I'm in, in three months in 2023, I'm going to have my book ready. Awesome. Well, I'll tell you what, when it's out, I'll be, I'll be the first one. And I'm sure you'll be signing, uh, you'll be signing autographs or something, signing books. I'll be there. I'll, I'll get you to sign it for me. How about that? I'll be the first one. Absolutely. In Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so as we're, you know, we're, we're winding down here, I want to ask you, you know, what does the, uh, obviously you talk about writing a book. Um, what does the future look like for, for Derek Wittenberg? Man, I enjoyed every day uh, working for Wolf Bag Nation and, and helping not just fundraising, but connecting people in, in our space. Uh, and the athletic department, our teams were excited about our, our future there. Our university is, you know, just growing and getting better every day. And uh, just connecting in the, com in the community, man. It's all good stuff. So I'm excited. Every day I get a chance to wake up, baby. It's all good stuff. Even, uh, even <laughs> connecting with you guys today. It's great stuff, man. And uh, hope this helps you guys continue to do what you're doing. And I uh, hope you can get better. And, and uh, your journey is going to be exciting, guys. You, you, can, you can make something happen. You can make something positive happen in your community. Awesome. Awesome. So if you like what you heard today, folks, please uh, share on social media. Uh, connect with us on social media. You know, we're on YouTube. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook at Somehow We Manage. Um, Derek, we're, we're very, very appreciative of you coming on. Like you said, a lot of great stuff, a lot of good insight, um, but we're, we're very appreciative. Thank you for your time. Uh, I think Spencer has one thing he wants to ask from you as we, as we sign off here. As, yes. As we sign off, I want to hear the famous catch or it hit me on the ground. <laughs> hey, man, dream, believe, work, now finish. Hit me on the ground. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Hey, thanks a lot, Whit. We appreciate it. All right. Appreciate you guys. All yes, right. Sir.